So what is pruning? Pruning uh, basics. Uh, pruning is a selective removal of specific plant parts. And so we always want to start with the right plant in the right place. And by doing that, we can minimize the amount of pruning we're going to have to do. Now, one of the questions that always comes up in my mind when we talk about pruning is why are we pruning? Do we have a plant that's oversized? Is the shape not good? Um, has there been storm damage to the, to the plant? Um, what is the reason that we're pruning? And when we ask that question first, it'll help us get to why we, or what we need to do. Um, so why are we pruning? And for that, we have several reasons that we would prune. Uh, the very first, when you first plant your trees, you wanna treat or train the young trees, kind of like we do with our children. We wanna train them up in the way that they will go. And so when we train those young trees, we're looking at the, the crotch angles. And so the crotch angle is the, the angle between the main stem and where the branch comes out. So if you were looking at me and this is my main stem and the branch is coming out this way, I want a nice crotch angle of about 60 to 90 degrees. And that's gonna keep my branches from breaking. They're gonna be able to handle a heavier load. So the way that we do that is we train the tree when we first, uh, we, we first plant it for about the first five years or so. The next reason is to maintain the, the health of the, of the plant, uh, whether it's a, a shrub um, or a large shade tree, either one, uh, we need to uh, prune to maintain the health of the plant. And we look at things like, you know, do we have diseased wood? Uh, do we have dead branches? Um, is the tree uh, maybe uh, a little too uh, crowded? And then of course, aesthetics. You know, um, somewhere between 20 and 30% of our home's value comes from the aesthetics. Our, of, of our lawns and our landscaping. And so when we look at aesthetics, it's very important in a landscape situation. And then we wanna remove any water sprouts or suckers that we may have. Um, and we'll talk about those a, a little bit more in depth later on. And then we also wanna talk about uh, how we can increase light penetration to the rest of the tree. A lot of times when we have trees that aren't ever pruned, they get really thick. And when they're real thick, we have that veneer of, of uh, foliage around the outside. The other problem that we have is some of our shrubs, you know, something like a boxwood. So boxwoods are gonna be sheared. And again, they're gonna have that veneer of foliage. Well, if you get inside of that, we don't have any, any, uh, any foliage. And the reason is because there's no light penetration. Now, something like a boxwood, that's okay. But when we look at our trees, we really want to have a, a good secondary growth within the canopy of the tree. And then lastly, um, we think about safety. You know, as you're backing out of your driveway and you're trying to pull out into the road, you want to be able to see both ways. If you can't see both ways, then there's a safety problem. We may need to take a branch out or maybe even move a bush that, at that point. So what is pruning? Well, for one thing, we don't want to let this happen to our crepe myrtles. Um, this is something we see all over town. I see fresh cuts. I see cuts like this that have been, been done like that for years. Um, and it's not necessarily that it's going to kill the tree. It's just incredibly unsightly. And we'll, we'll talk about uh, crepe myrtles specifically here in a little bit. Let's move into pruning, though. What are we going to prune? Um, so when we start, we're going to start with the three Ds. And the three Ds, and it's not a Steven Spielberg movie, it's dead, diseased, and dying wood. So when we crawl up in there and, and we're, we're wanting to, to start pruning, the first thing we're going to do is look for the dead, diseased, or dying wood. Um, and you can tell it really easy from the, the good wood just by looking at it. Next, we're going to look for crossing branches. Branches, especially on something like a crepe myrtle where we have multiple stems, they're going to cross. And when the wind blows, they're gonna move back and forth. And as they do, they're cutting into one another. And remember with a tree, all of our conductive tissue is right underneath the bark. So when they cut into one another, they're cutting off that conductive uh, material that's moving carbohydrates from the leaves down to the roots and moving soil nutrients and water um, from the roots up to the leaves. So it's a very important thing for us to, to take out one of those or the other. And then lastly, we're going to look at several different factors that kind of all boil down together. Uh, we're going to look at the overall shape. We want to get, again, going back to aesthetics, we want to have a good shape to our tree. We don't want, you know, um, crazy branches going here or there, or if we've got shrubs, we want to keep them in shape. We want to look at crowding, and crowding is real big. 
And uh, when we talk about crowding, we can look at that in two different ways. One, our plants are getting mature, our trees are getting mature, maybe our shrubs are growing together. Um, and it's, it's really causing us not to have good air movement in between the, the, the plants. So that's one type of crowding. Another type of crowding is when the tree uh, or shrub gets too full. And when it gets too full, air movement is cut down, moving within the tree. And when we cut down the air movement, um, it lengthens the period of wetness on the leaves, which leads us to disease. So we'll have more disease pressure the longer we lengthen that leaf wetness period. So we want to cut down on crowding. And then suckers, uh, again, we mentioned water sprouts earlier, but waters or suckers, uh, the water sprouts or suckers are basically the same thing. And what we're looking at there, uh, if we heavily prune the year before, a lot of times we're going to see a lot of those. They come at the base of the tree. Um, they're just, um, they're little buds that have been hidden. Um, but when we prune, we activate a stress hormone that tells the tree to send those out. Now, in some cases, um, think of something again, like a crepe myrtle, they're going to put them off no matter what you do to them. Um, you can leave them alone and they can be nice and healthy and they're still going to put them off. Um, we have some loripedlums out here in the in the front by the building, and they tend to sucker too. Um, so some of them will just put them off no matter what. And we'll talk about what to do with those here in a minute. And then again, you know, looking at that light penetration, um, where are all the leaves? We want to make sure we're getting good light penetration into the tree. So how are we going to do it? Um, very first and foremost, we want to have the right tools for the job. And so when we think about the right tools, I don't want to have my hand pruners and try to cut something that's two inches thick. Two inches in diameter is way too much for your hand pruners. And so I'm going to be pulling on it and hacking on it and I'm going to move it around and I'm going to try to take it off um, and show how strong I am, but it just isn't going to work out well. I'm either going to break my tools or I'm going to cause a wound to the tree that isn't necessary. And so I want to use the right tool for the job. So if I've got something that's about two inches and maybe an inch, um, I'm going to use my loppers. My loppers are the long handled cutters and I, I like a, bi a bypass pruner. So a bypass pruner has a cutting edge and it goes by something that's solid, just like that, um, and snaps it right off. The other thing I want to do is I want to make sure before I use my tools for the season that they're good and sharp. And it doesn't take very long to get a good sharp tool. Um, you, you'll have a little wet stone that you can buy at Lowe's or any hardware store like D&H. Um, and it just takes maybe five, 10 minutes, a little bit of oil, and then uh, you know, five, 10 minutes of, of uh, sharpening the blade. And the other thing you want to remember, only sharpen it on the one side. So we want to have a, the right tool for the job. We want to have sharp tools. The other thing when we talk about uh, the right tool for the job, um, the only time we want to use a, a chainsaw for pruning is when we have down wood after it's already been taken up and we're cutting it up to haul it off or whatever, um, that's the point where we use a chainsaw. Any other pruning that we're really doing, we're really looking to use a, a, a little handheld pruning saw. Um, and again, that's a specialized saw. It, it only cuts on the back strokes that you have extra control over what you're doing. Um, so those are the right tools for the job. Now, when we talk about pruning types, there are several different kinds we can pinch um, new growth or suckers between our fingers when they're nice and pliable and pull them off. Um, heading back is, a, is another one uh, that's used to remove terminal growth. And so your terminal growth is your branch ends. And we're doing that. We're really trying to strengthen a branch and we're trying to cause more branching when we use a heading cut. Now, I'm not talking about the cuts that you see around town where folks come back and they, they might cut every branch on a tree to within a, a foot of where it comes out of the trunk. That's not a good practice. Um, most uh, good arborists will not, uh, um, certified arborists, certified tree cutters, they're not even going to do that kind of thing for you. So that's not something you want to look at. That would be considered, considered a heading cut. Um, but what we're really after with a heading cut is to stiffen branches, uh, to strengthen them against a storm, strengthen them against a heavier load, um, and to cause more branching with them. Um, and then we have a thinning cut. And with a thinning cut, we're removing, we're removing entire branches all the way back uh, to the branch collar. And so when we talk about the branch collar, I mean, I have, I've got a good uh, uh, graphic of that coming up. 
when we talk about the Grant's collar, it's kind of like your shoulder. And so when your shoulder, you've got this nice rounded part here, and then it kind of comes out from your chest where your shoulder attaches, well, that branch collar would be similar to this area right here. So not up on the shoulder where we're, we'd be cutting off our arm, you know, nice and flush, but kind of out here where we're coming at an angle. And again, like I said, we'll have a, a, good, a good look at that here in a minute. And then we've also got a renewal cut. And a renewal cut is cutting whole canes or uh, uh, shrub branches down to the ground so that we can rejuvenate the bush. And in some cases, you can cut the entire thing down and rejuvenate it. So when we go back to the, the picture that you just saw with the crepe murder on it, um, one way that we can get those trees back to make them look aesthetically pleasing once again is to cut those all the way back to the ground. So roughly six inches above ground is where you would cut that off, all of the stems. And when they come back, you would select three to five that you want to keep or a single one if that's if you wanted a single tr uh, trunk tree. Um, but usually three to five is what we would look for. And so that would be a renewal or rejuvenating cut. And then shearing again, you know, is typically used on hedges, something like a boxwood to keep it in shape. All right, so how are we going to prune? Uh -oh. Pinching, removing new growth. Uh oh, I think we already went through this. So there we go. Here's our graphic. And so when we're, here's our branch collar that we're talking about. You can kind of see it come around like this. Kind of see it come around like this. And then on the bottom, you see it come around. Our branch collar is this part right here. And this is a really easy one to see. The other reason I chose this, uh, this is an excerpt from the, the Extension Gardener Handbook, by the way, on page 1126. And that's what we used to, to uh, train our master gardeners with. Um, the other reason I wanted to show this is to show the three cut method. So when we've got a larger branch. One of the first things that happens when you cut that larger branch is it you don't get to cut it all the way through. The weight of it pulls it down and then it rips the bark off of it as it falls. Well, in order to keep it from doing that, we can use a three cut method. So we have the first cut on the underside right here. And then our second cut is going to be in front of that. And that's where we'll go ahead and we'll take the whole branch off. And then we're only dealing with this little bit so we can really get the cut where we want it to be. So our third cut is gonna be taking the, the stub off. So our first cut is here to relieve pressure and to make sure that we don't rip the bark off. The second cut is on top and that takes the, the whole branch off. And then we come back with a third cut at a nice angle following the branch collar and we cut that little stub off. And we do that for a couple of reasons. One. Cutting it on the branch collar helps it repair itself. Well, that's not really the right terminology. Um, what a tree does is it compartmentalizes the wound. So it'll, it'll grow over and it'll seal that wood off. And eventually it'll cover it up completely if we do it right. And when we talk about a thinning cut, this is really what we're talking about. So we wanna remove branches all the way back. Um, you can see they took several off of here, off of here. So this is what it looks like before, and then this is what it looks like after the cuts are done. And so remember that thinning cut is there so that we can get air movement through the, the tree. All right, so when do we prune? Now that can be the million dollar question. Um, it's very species dependent. However, we do have a few rules that apply. Our major pruning is always done in the dormant season. And that doesn't mean we wait till right after the first frost. We really wanna wait until later on, um, like mid to late February to do a lot of that kind of pruning. And the reason is because uh, we'll have a freeze event at least some point usually uh, during the winter. And when we do, if we've already pruned, um, a lot of times we'll get a, a pith split from the freeze. The other problem is if we prune too early, the trees aren't completely dormant, it can cause it to put on new growth. If we have any new growth in that time, um, that will die with that freeze and then we'll stress the tree out. So we want to wait until at least uh, early to mid-February, um, even in the late February, to do our major pruning. Now, a major pruning is taking off a third of the, of the plant, a third of the overall plant at one time is a major pruning. We don't want to take any more than that. Now, light pruning, we can do that almost any time. Now, 
Annual pruning, if needed, is done around flowering. So in the, if we have something that flowers summer or fall, that's gonna be done in late winter or early spring because it's flowering on new wood. If we have something, uh, say for instance, like a dogwood uh, that flowers in the spring, we wanna do that after the flowers are spent, if it's needed. And it's not necessary for us to prune every year on our trees or shrubs. Um, now the general cutoff in, in looking at this is things that, that flower in the spring, we want to make sure that we get those cut uh, in our, if the flower is before May, excuse me, wanting, we want to get those cut in June or July. If we're flowering after the first of May, um, we want to cut those in late winter, early spring. Yep. All right. So pruning, we're going to get into some some different things here um, with crepe myrtles. Again, it could be crepe or crepe. It's tomato versus tomato, really um, doesn't really matter. That's why we go by scientific names for most things. Uh, but please don't chop them all. They're just incredibly unsightly. Um, there's 90 cultivars of, of crepe myrtle. And so they range in size from two feet all the way up to 45 feet. I'm sure there's one that fits in your space. So when you're thinking about new plants, you always wanna make, make sure you're doing or putting the right plant in the right place. And so there's several different factors when you look at that. And one of those is size. How big of an area does that plant have to fill? Um, are you gonna constantly have to cut it back? Because if you are, you know, that's really a maintenance nightmare and you, you want something else. Um, so keep that in mind when you're picking things out. Uh, pick the size you need from a reputable nursery. A lot of times you go to some place and I'm not going to name drop anywhere, um, but they're not going to have the right information on that tag that they're giving you. And so you want to go to a reputable nursery for nothing else to make sure that you're getting a good plant and that it is what they say it is. Now when we're looking at crepe myrtles again, they, we're going to start with pruning out the three D's you know, dead, diseased, or damaged wood. We're going to look for crossovers. We're going to prune out the smaller stuff that's smaller than uh, a, a pencil size diameter. Um, and then we can look at deadheading in the summer and deadheading is just clipping the, the spent flowers off and that can promote rebloom. It's not necessary, um, but it's one of the things that you can do to, pre to uh, promote rebloom. And then we want to break off the suckers. And again, if we catch them when they're nice and, and little, we can pinch them off. If we catch them when they're a little larger, we're going to break them off by hand. And that'll keep them from coming back that season. Now, another thing I was asked to talk about was knockout roses. And knockout roses are a little different than some of your other roses. Actually, they're a lot different. Um, knockouts are intended to be large shrubs. And so we need to prune them as such. Um, we, they don't need to be heavily pruned every year, uh, but pruning heavy every few years helps to control size. It'll also give you that renewal prune. I mean, when you do that, you're looking at doing a heading cut to bring it down, and then you're also going to do a thinning cut to prevent new branching within the, the, the bush. And that'll be done in uh, late February or just as buds begin to swell. So right about now. Now hydrangeas, hydrangeas really depends on the species. Um, some bloom early, some bloom late. Uh, there are a few that, that actually bloom all season. And so you really know what you have to know what you have in order to know when to prune it. And if you don't know exactly what it is, you can still figure it out just by watching when it blooms. So our big leaf, our oak leaf, um, the mountain or climbing, they're they're all gonna be blooming on old wood. And remember when we're blooming on old wood, that means our flowers are gonna come in the spring or shortly thereafter. And so if we prune them in late winter, we're not gonna have any blooms. So old wood, we wanna prune after the flowers are spent. New wood, remember, we're pruning those in late spring uh, or, or late uh, winter, early spring. So that would be panicle and uh, the smooth species. And here's a shot that I, I took along my travels. I love this one. I just had to share it. And so here's another uh, chart that kind of shows what we were just talking about. Um, and what we're really looking at is, are we blooming on old growth or new growth? That's what it really boils down to. All right, we're moving kind of slow here, but uh, we're still gonna 
see what we can do with it. We're going to move right on into soils here. So what are soils? I mean, soils is a, a living, breathing, natural entity composed of solids, liquids, and gases. Now, soil produ uh, provides several functions, and we're going to talk about those. Normally, if we were in class, I'd make you name them, um, but since we're on Zoom, I'll give them to you. Uh, but we're going to provide habitat for organisms through soil. We're going to recycle waste, filter water. It provides uh, engineering material. And lastly, uh, soil is a medium for plant growth. And that's what we're really most worried about for us. Now, having soil is kind of like the story about uh, Goldilocks. Y'all remember Goldilocks and the three bears. You know, she couldn't get her porridge just right and she couldn't get her, her bed just right. Well, soil is a lot of the same. And so some soils are compacted. And this is a, a, a diagram of what a compacted soil is really made up of. And so here you can see the mineral part of the soil. And then here you can see what part of the soil is made up of water, what part is made up of air, and then what part is organic material. So this is what a compacted soil is going to boil down to. Here is a poorly drained soil. And so um, we've got compacted soil and then we move to a poorly drained soil. And that's uh, more, most of the pore space here is being taken up by water, very little by air. Again, We've got our mineral soil, and then here we've got 5% organic. Now let's look at what an ideal soil is. So an ideal soil, we're still at that 45% mineral, we're at the 5% organic, but our pore space is, is taking up 25% of water, and then we have 25% of that pore space occupied by air. And this is what would be considered the ideal soil. So what about your soil at Cypress Landing? And so your soil is predominantly clay and there's some very deep clays over there. Um, and this of course can pr produce or present some challenges for growing plants. Um, well, we're gonna talk about those here too. Um, basically clay is the finest textured soil that we have, um, which is basically a, a fancy way of saying it displays poor drainage and high compaction characteristics. So both of those two things that Goldilocks would not have wanted is what y'all have. Um, and so clay, uh, the upside is it, it holds the most nutrients. It has the most uh, nutrient holding capacity, um, which we call the cation exchange capacity. Uh, however, it's highly erodible and expands and contracts with moisture and heat. And so in the summer, when we get dry, you could get these big cracks. Um, but when we get real wet, it gets real compacted and it gets real slick. So what can we do about it? Um, really, there's not a whole lot you can do about it. I mean, it's not like you can dig it out and put new soil in. So the better question is how to improve the soil. And we can do that through different soil amendments. And one of the best that we're gonna talk about is organic matter. Organic matter can be made up of anything basically organic uh, or that contains organic material. That could be compost, uh, compost that you buy commercially, it can be compost that you make in your backyard. Uh, it could be something uh, as simple as cotton gin waste that you can go get for free as a byproduct of the ginning process. It could be hay or straw that you put out and let biodegrade. Uh, it could even be leaves that you gather up in your yard um, and compost in place and so on. There are so many different things that you can use. And again, you can find listings of those in the Extension Gardener Handbook. And I'll, I'll, show, I'll talk about that here in just a minute too. Um, but how do we apply it? If it's new construction and it's prior to planting our yards or any beds, uh, we want to put about a three inch layer on top and then incorporate six to eight inches deep into the soil profile. Uh, if you're doing it after planting, you can add a small amount and rake into your beds. Um, now, when we say small amount, it's roughly about an inch uh, over top of the soil surface per year and you'd rake that into your beds as best as possible. Um, after planting in your lawn, uh, you would use a core aerator and a core aerator pulls a whole plug of soil out. And then you come back and you top dress with organic material. Now this does require some special equipment. You can rent that equipment at some of the different places between here and Greenville. Now, if you've got bare spots in your lawn, uh, one of the best things to do for that is to put about an inch of, of uh, organic material on top of it and then use your metal rake and rake it in. 
it makes a great planting surface for your grass to migrate into to fill those spots in. So you don't have to replant it. Now, how does this help? Uh, by or adding organic matter, you can add uh, porosity to tight compacted soils. Remember earlier, we were talking about how much of that pore space in our ideal soil is taken up by air and water. We had 25% taken up by air, 25% taken up by water. And so when we have a real tight soil like clay, a real fine compacted soil, um, what that does is it opens it up a little bit. It allows the water to drain through it a, a little quicker. It also sucks up rainwater like a sponge. And so the, as the rain or the, the water filtrates in, it's gonna suck it up and then it's gonna time release moisture back into the soil profile. So you have moisture available for a longer time, but you're getting the added benefit of some drainage. And lastly, organic matter uh, breaks down through microbial activity to release nutrients that are then available to the plants. So it's a good thing to, to build your soil all the way around. Now, we can also look at alternatives. And one of those alternatives is gardening and raised beds. Now your raised beds is something that you can make. Um, you can either make them out of uh, wood, you can use uh, cinder blocks. Um, we even have uh, um, uh, fabric or wood, uh, synthetic wood that you can use now. Um, the big thing is they need to be a minimum of eight inches, but 12 inches tall is better. And so when we say tall, that's deep. We wanna be able to get at least eight to 12 inches of soil so that we can have plenty of room for our, our plants to root. Um, in those beds. They can be made taller to accommodate a bad back too. We used to have one here that was wheelchair accessible. It was made out of cinder blocks and stood uh, right about two and a half, three feet tall. Um, and then you can fill those with a, a mixture of soil or compost. Um, but you wanna real, be very careful about bringing soil in. You know, a lot of times when you bring topsoil in, what folks call topsoil, uh, it's not necessarily topsoil. Um, there's no certifying agency and there's no certification process for, for certified topsoil in North Carolina. And so you have to be very careful that you're bringing that in from a good source. You want to look at it really well before you bring it in. A lot of times it's a source for disease and or weed issues. Um, so be careful with that. But now once we have our raised beds, we can use it for vegetables, flowers, uh, small shrubs, basically anything can go in there. And you don't necessarily have to, when we're saying raised bed, I'm talking about a nice uh, planting surface for gardens, but a raised bed can also be a place where you're just adding compost and soil mixed to the top of the soil profile so that you can get trees up out of the water level. So that's a, a planting bed as well. Another alternative um, is, is a rain garden. You know, one thing we wanna be very uh, weary of is not to fight mother nature. We will lose. We're just not equipped to be able to do something like that. If we have a spot where we're, we're wet after these rains like we've had uh, the last couple of weeks, that might be a great spot for a rain garden. Now, um, a rain garden uses plants that don't mind wet feet to soak that water up. It also stops water from running, uh, slows down any, any kind of erosion because the water never leaves the property when, it, when you use a rain garden in that way. Um, and so it really minimizes our rain off. We have some groundwater recharge from it. And typically we get some really pretty uh, native plants out of that. And Extension has numerous publications to help with putting rain gardens together. If you're interested in that, be sure you contact me. Now, what about amending the planting holes? You know, a lot of times you, you get online and you look at uh, places that, that uh, are giving you information that's not university research-based information, um, which is what you get from extension. And they talk about amending your planting hole for a tree. Well, when you do that, what ends up happening is you excavate and then you put a, a, a different soil or, or, or mixture in there than what was in there to start with. And all your water has to percolate through that and then it starts to percolate through the, 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 the native soil that's around it. So in a sense, what you've done is you've created a big bowl and all it's gonna do is hold water. And when it holds water, it's, it's gonna be a real problem for our plants. We're gonna see a lot of root rots out of that. We're gonna see stunning, um, just overall loss of vigor with our trees and, and, and shrubs if we're doing that kind of thing. So be very weary of, of, uh, of, of doing that kind of thing. Um, 
kills plants dead. I have a four-year-old, and that's the kind of terms we use, kills plants dead. All right, I think we're getting back on track here. Um, now we're going to get into warm season turf uh, and discuss a few things about that. Okay, so here's a picture, and this is on the uh, sound front over in Washington County, um, but I wanted to, to put it on here just to talk about real quick. You can see how we have a straight line here. Oftentimes when you have a straight line, um, that means that damage is, is typically caused by a herbicide. As the other thing that you can see, you can see how yellow some, some of these places are or how chlorotic they are. That's what yellowing would be. And so um, I was called out to this, this uh, homeowner's lawn to, to kind of see what they had going on. And I noticed this straight line. And this actually, I, I talk about straight line damage being uh, leading to herbicide. Um, but what they did, they had a landscaper come in and they had a landscaper level out with topsoil um, their entire yard. And what that landscaper did is they just threw sand out there and leveled it out and then put sod on top of it. But what you've got, the reason we've got a straight line here is because the sod never rooted. Um, remember how I talked about that bowl shape? This is the same thing, even though it's a sand and sand drains really fast. What happens when we do that, we, we have the water go through the sand and then it sits on top of that clay layer. Um, and so we have a waterlogged soil that we never see. And so that's what killed this corner right here. So keep those kinds of things in mind if you're having renovations done on your lawn or uh, any kind of leveling practice. Um, your landscaper needs to incorporate whatever they're putting on there. You just don't want to put it out and level it. It needs to be incorporated down to that six to eight inch mark like we talked about with our compost earlier. Now we get into warm season turf. Um, it's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, warm season turf is turf that grows during the warm season. I mean, we can't make this stuff up, right? So Basically, east of Highway 95 in the coastal plains, all we really want to grow is warm season turf. Um, Research-based information tells us, you know, our, our temperature, our climate is such with our high humidity or higher temperatures uh, that cool season grasses like tall fescue, uh, you hear of Kentucky 31, there's fine fescue. Um, they, they, they make it for about a year and then they're spotty the second year. And then the third year, all you have left is that uh, that tall fescue and it's in a bunch and it stands about that much higher than the rest of your lawn. It grows faster, um, but it dies out in our, in our hot summer heat. And so it's, it's not recommended for us. So that puts us in the arena of warm season turf. And of course, this is turf that door, goes dormant in the fall. Um, I had an uncle, he, he, uh, he, he was in the military, so he lived up north. And he came back down to North Carolina and uh, he called me, he was living in Garner and he called me and he says, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm so upset. I bought this house. He told me it had good grass and all my grass is dead. And, you know, I just, I did, I had this job maybe two years or so. And so I was talking to him about what the deal was and he said, well, I don't want it. Give me, give me the cool season stuff. So it's pretty good story. Uh, but warm season turf consists of Bermuda, Zoysia, St. Augustine and centipede grass. Those are the four main grasses that we're gonna grow well here. Now, when we talk about cool season grasses, you see this area up to the north and really we, we are in a transition zone here in North Carolina where we don't grow cool season or warm season grasses real, real well. Um, you can see we're, we're right on the edge of that warm season where we, we, we would grow well. Um, which actually makes North Carolina a great state uh, to, to research grasses because they're very stressed often. And so we, we have one of the premier uh, turf research um, um, group or staff here at North Carolina uh, out of all the land grant colleges. Now we're gonna go over, over these pretty quick, but um, Bermuda, uh, is, is very drought tolerant. It's tolerant of poor soil, so it grows well in a lot of our, our eastern North Carolina soils. Needs frequent mowing and fertilization for best results. Um, it's very aggressive and can become invasive. It's one of those that if, if left unchecked, it will take over your flower beds very quickly. However, the fact that it grows so fast means it repairs itself really well 
causing it to be very wear resistant. So it's a great grass, especially if you've got kids, dogs, any of that kind of thing. Um, uh, Bermuda, common Bermuda can be seeded. So that's like when, when you go to Lowe's or, or DNH equipment or any of those places and you see the, the bags of, of Bermuda, that's all common Bermuda. Um, the hybrids, which are more sought after, uh, and grow a little better are going to be vegetatively propagated. So we talk about vegetatively propagated. That means we're going to have to do, uh, we're going to have to plant them by sod, um, sprigs, or plugs. And plugs are just essentially uh, sod cut up into little four to six inches uh, plugs. And then we put those in the soil and encourage them to grow in. Sprigs are a little different. Sprigs are going to be rhizomes or stolons, which are plant parts. Um, that will reproduce, vegetatively reproduce the plants, and they're sold by the bushel. It's a lot cheaper to get them that way. Now, cultivars that you want to look for are Tifway and Vermont. Now, let's look at Zoysia. Zoysia is a great grass, uh, extremely dense, um, so much so that it feels like you're walking on carpet. It's actually cushiony underneath of your feet, um, very wear resistant. And, you know, the thing that I like about Zoysia is that when you talk to the turf professionals at NC State, I just told you world renowned uh, for their turf program. When you talk to the, the turf professionals at NC State, 90% of them have zoysia. The other 10% are, are, are have an experimentation going on in their yard. It's kind of like a mechanic's uh, car. It just never really looks that good. Um, so we're not, we're going to throw them out. Um, but very drought and disease tolerant. Um, it will eventually choke out most weeds, uh, less mowing than Bermuda, but you're still going to be mowing every five days or so. Um, really with Bermuda, if it's fertilized right and has good irrigation, um, every two to three days Bermuda is going to need to be mowed. Now, one of the problems with Zoysia though, is it's slow to establish. Um, two to three years to really do well. Uh, primarily planted vegetatively, as you can see down towards the bottom, zenith and sunrise can be seeded. They're difficult to find though. Um, here are several cultivars that you can look at. The big thing with zoysia is you wanna look at texture. Um, the finer zoysias, I, I mean, they're, they're amazing. They're absolutely beautiful grasses, but they've gotta be mowed with a real mower. They cannot be mowed with your regular rotary blade mower. Um, uh, it's just too thick. And so what happens is the, the blade actually pushes it down and you get a very uneven cut, looks terrible. Um, so keep that in mind if you're looking at zoysia. You want to look at the medium uh, to, to coarser textures unless you have a real mower or planning to get a real mower. Now next we'll talk about St. Augustine. Um, and St. Augustine grows best in fertile soil uh, with well-drained soils. Uh, but the, the problem there is St. Augustine is also our most salt tolerant. And so we want to plant it along the river. And so it, it, it tolerates getting flooded out uh, for short periods of time, uh, but really likes well-drained fertile soils. It's very fast growing, um, it has very good shade tolerance. Um, it, like I said it's salt uh, tolerance, heat tolerant and drought tolerant. Now, of course, you know, it looks really good here, but when we move to the next, uh, the next slide, it's highly susceptible to winter kill. So we tolerate drought, we tolerate uh, salt, we tolerate high heat. Um, but if we get too cold in the winter, we can have a full kill. And too cold is less than 20 degrees in most cases. Um, so St. Augustine just does not do well with the cold. Um, some varieties do better than others. I believe the variety of Raleigh is the best one for uh, cold tolerance. Um, but vegetative establishment only as pl uh, plugs or sod. This is one you can't use sprigs on. It has to be plugs or sod. Um, still, we're looking at frequent mowing and it, it tends to have excessive thatch. And if you don't know what thatch is, thatch is a, a layer of dead tissue in between the crown of the plant and the soil surface. And if we get too much buildup of thatch, it can cause our plants to rot, can harbor insects. Um, and just like we we're talking about with our trees earlier, it hinders airflow and hinders how the, the, the plants can dry out after dew or rain events. Now, lastly, we'll talk about centipede. Now, first we talked about Bermuda, which is our fastest growing uh, grass. Now we're gonna talk about centipede, which is our slowest growing grass. Um, now centipede has a much lighter color than the other grasses. It's almost considered a green apple color. Uh, does not tolerate traffic, um, does not tolerate compaction, high pH, drought, or heavy shade. 
Uh, winter kill is a potential problem. If we get down to the, the low teens to upper single digits, um, centipede is going to have an issue with winter kill. Um, but more often than not, we see late season frost kill a lot of centipede. Um, that's a that's a pretty big deal. Now, if you've got centipede that's yellowing, I mentioned earlier, that's called chlorosis. Um, if your centipede is looking chlorotic, it's a good sign that you've got a higher pH and you should get a soil sample. Now, centipede is mostly seeded. Uh, it can be uh, uh, propagated from sod or sprigs, but it's hard to find them. Uh, we do, however, in Beaufort County have a centipede sod farm. Um, and we also, right across the, the river, um, in the Craven County, we've got McElwain's, which grows centipede. So it is available near us. Uh, but uh, keep in mind, we only grow common centipede in North Carolina. We don't have any of the improved varieties that we grow. All right, so now let's talk about how we take care of our turf. Uh, seasonal care is very important. Um, maintenance calendars can be found on NCSU's Turf Files website, and I'll have a resource page at the very end where you can find that. Um, so don't try to write it down here. I have it at the end. Uh, but here's what that calendar looks like, and it tells you what to do on a quarterly basis. Okay, so we're looking at March through May, June through August, September through November, and then December through February. And it's going to go through different things that you should be doing. It's going to talk a little bit about mowing height, mowing frequency, fertilizer, that kind of thing. So these maintenance calendars, and, and you know, you have to get the right one for your grass, uh, but these maintenance calendars are a lifesaver. And that takes me to don't guess soil test. We talked about fertilizer. If you're, if you're just throwing fertilizer and lime at your yard, um, it, it's like playing roulette. Not a good idea. So don't guess soil test. Um, and in order, order to do that, you want to come to my office and get a soil sample. Um, and this will, will help you get the pH right for your turf uh, by giving you a lime recommendation. Um, mentioned earlier, centipede doesn't like high pH. It's the only grass out of all the warm season grasses that likes to be down around 5.5. Um, and that range can actually go on down into five. Uh, all the other warm season grasses tend to hang out around six and 6.5 pH. And then lastly, we'll get a, a fertilizer recommendation so we know exactly what our grass needs. So right plant, right place, I, you're going to hear me go back to that often. Um, warm season turf needs, it needs plenty of sunshine, six to eight hours of direct sunlight. Uh, we said earlier that St. Augustine uh, can tolerate a little bit more shade, really still looking four to five hours minimum. Uh, if you're getting any less than that, you really want to think about putting mulch and, and finding some, some shade loving plants that will go in there because uh, warm season grass is not going to do well. On average, we want to get uh, an inch of water per week, um, and this includes both irrigation and precipitation. We want all that to add up to one inch. So I don't think right now we're going to need water for a little while. Um, with our clay soils, like y'all have over in Cypress Landing, we can actually drop that back to about three quarters of an inch a week. Um, keeping an eye on the plants, if they uh, start leaves start to curl at all, if we start to see a little brown on the margins, um, we know we need a little bit more. We're looking at our grasses. If you walk across your grass and you can see your footsteps, looks kind of has a, a somewhat purplish look, you know your grass is suffering from some drought susceptibility. Um, you're going to want to up your water a little bit. Now, if you're watering um, on, a, on a, a normal basis, I dare say you won't see that. Um, and, you know, the crazy thing about eastern North Carolina, we get somewhere between 50 and 60 inches of rain on average. The problem is it doesn't all come when we need it. And so if we could space that out, when we got that inch a week, we'd be in good shape. Um, but sometimes we do need to irrigate. And when we do irrigate, we want to water deep and infrequently. And when we say deep and infrequently, it means we want to put a lot of water out um, and we want to put it out uh, infrequently. So, um, if I was going to recommend something, I'd say maybe Mondays and Thursdays or Mondays and Fridays. And I'd look at putting out something around a half an inch to three quarters of an inch per uh, irrigation uh, uh, event. And so that'll keep you where your grass never fully uh, has those drought symptoms. Uh, but it will keep it where it dries out enough that you're encouraging root growth. And when we're encouraging root growth, we're setting our plants up to do better during drought events. So 
I always go back to a thick stand of healthy turf will withstand most weed pressure and disease. We always want to start with a, a thick stand, a healthy stand of turf. And the only way we can do that is through cultural practices. And cultural practices, just keep in the back of your mind, are things that we can control, things that we can do. Okay, so the number one cultural practice is mowing your grass at the correct time and the correct height. And you'll find that information on turf files. I'm not going to go over each and every grass uh, with the exception of St. Augustine. Uh, but most of our grasses, as a general rule, are going to want to be between one and two inches. Now, we don't want to cut more than a third off at the time. So when we're looking at that one to two inches, factor that in as to when your timing is going to occur to want to cut the grass. Uh, I did say the exception is St. Augustine. St. Augustine likes to be a lot, a lot longer. Um, so two and a half to four inches is where we want to keep our St. Augustine. Now, when we look at weed control, we always want to read the label. That's the very first thing. Um, and then look at the maintenance calendar for your turf. It's going to recommend the timing of your application. Uh, if you don't remember that, uh, here's a little thing to go by at the bottom. Um, but I think it's important to say that herbicides do not make up the backbone of your weed control. Your cultural practices that promote a healthy, uh, thick stand of turf is what really uh, should be the backbone of your weed control. Uh, but if you're looking at timing uh, for summer or winter annuals, we want to look at a pre-emergent application in early September, and then again in early uh, February. I mentioned annuals. Um, our winter annuals are going to germinate sometime late September into October. And so when we put that pre-emergent out in early September, it gives us roughly three to four months of protection against those plants being able to come up after they germinate. And then again in February, um, that's when our uh, warm season or um, annuals are going to start to germinate, things like crabgrass. Um, typically, the last few years, I've seen crabgrass germinate really early. However, I've not seen it this year. We're a little bit cooler than what we have been. Uh, but when soil temperatures get up to about 55 degrees for three to five days in a row, we'll start to see crabgrass germinate. So far, we've, we've only been in the high of uh, 40s, so we're good there. And we look at a post-emergent application. Um, we're going to look at that for things that we missed or that germinated outside of our uh, pre-emergent uh, in mid-December. And then again, after green up. Now, green up, we don't want to put anything out during green up. And that's the period really between mid-March and uh, the first to second week of May, depending on how our season goes. That's the time where our warm season grasses are breaking dormancy, they're really coming out. Uh, but we're not fully out of green up until our soil temperatures reach 70 degrees. Now, when we look at perennials, perennials are, are weeds that are gonna come back every year. Um, they're not going to re-germinate. They're coming back from rhizomes or stolons. Maybe they die back to the soil surface, uh, but they're going to poke their ugly head out at least some point during the year. Um, and so our pre-emergents aren't going to work on those. However, a, a post-emergent, uh, which is after it's come up um, in early December, uh, early to mid-December, and then again after green up, will take care of a lot of those things. Now, you may need to follow up with a post-emergent uh, again, for hard to control perennials. So when we have things like Florida betony, which some of you may or may not have issues with, um, Florida betony is, is a weed that I see come in on a lot of topsoil or flood events. And it, it has a tuber um, that resembles a, rattles, a rattlesnake's rattle. Um, and so that tuber is nothing but stored up carbohydrates. Well, they store stored up carbohydrates are gonna allow um, that plant to come back and come back again and again. And so it's gonna re uh, require some follow-up. Now, let's see if we can get through this here pretty quick. Uh, moving into our native plants. So native plants are plants that are native to an area or region uh, without human intervention. And so why are natives important? Now, natives are more acclimated to our conditions, such as high humidity, um, the temperature extremes, uh, precipitation amounts, insect and disease pressure. Um, and then once established, they're, they're typically a lot less needy. It doesn't mean they're bulletproof, but they're a lot easier to grow and maintain than what some of the cultivars you're going to get from the nursery are. Now, how do we incorporate natives? 
again, I always go back to right plant, right place first. You know, what are your specific conditions? Um, what plants uh, are, are gonna have to fit your conditions? And how do you find that out? Well, the easiest way for me to recommend a plant is to steer folks to our extension uh, gardener plant toolbox. And again, we'll have this link later on. The link is up there, it's really simple. Uh, but if you type in plants, uh, NCSU for North Carolina State University in the Google, it's gonna come up. And so when we look at this, um, we're gonna come up here to find a plant. When we go to that, it's gonna bring up a page with all these things here on the side, all these attributes that we can select from. I like to tell folks it's a lot like uh, shopping auto trader for a car. You can pick the color, you can pick the year, you can pick how many doors, you can pick whether it's a V6, V8, diesel, whatever you want. It's basically the same thing. And so I picked a few things out for us. I went under cultural conditions and I picked light, uh, dappled sunlight. You know, where y'all are, you have some mature pine trees, you've got some mature hardwood trees. And so a lot of you don't have a whole lot of direct sunlight. So that would be dappled sunlight. The next thing I picked was clay soils. All right, and you can see when I pick these, it's whittling down my choices. And then lastly, I picked occasionally wet. And so what it does after that is, and this is just a screenshot of some of the things that come up, but what it does after that is it gives me a list of plants that are gonna fit my criteria. And then I can go in and I can look at these individual plants and it'll tell me whether those are natives or not. So that's a great place to start. Now, another place to look, when we go back to this homepage for our Extension Gardener Plant Toolbox, is over here on this on this right hand side, we're going to look at the NC uh, C grant uh, link. And that's going to bring us to a whole host of, of things for coastal landscapes on their page. And when I go to this page and scroll down, I'm going to find the resources. And when I look at resources and click on it, the very first thing I want to go to is the NC uh, coastal landscaping designs. This is a set of templates that they've they've put together. And when it comes up, it's gonna look just like this. As I scroll down, I'm gonna find a, a page like this that says, uh, download the full collection of designs. And when I do that, there are several different things to choose from. And I picked out one, screening with trees, and this is what it's gonna look like. It's gonna tell me sun, it's gonna tell me how much soil moisture I need, it's gonna tell me the seasonal color that I'm looking at. And then down here, it's gonna show me the trees, uh, species that I'm looking at, over here, I've got alternatives that I can use and all these are native plants. And then I'm gonna have a diagram to show me how those are gonna fit in with my existing uh, plantings. And so it's, it's really a comprehensive tool that we have. The other thing that we have on there is we have this, uh, the coastal landscaping booklet and then they also have this brochure. The brochure is really nice because you can print it off and you can take it to a nursery with you. Uh, the PDF, you can put it on a phone or, or any other device that you might have, and you can carry that with you to a nursery and have access with it as well. Uh, but there are, are uh, a whole host of native plants in here, everything from vines to flowers uh, to shade trees. So it's a great resource. And again, that's found on that resources page. Here's a screenshot of that same resources page. Here's the booklet, here's the brochure. And again, I'm gonna show you where to get all that with the link uh, uh, later on, or you can use the tabs on our Extension Gardener site. Let's see, the other thing I wanted to show you underneath this more resources, we can come into that and we see plant information. Here's the designs again, and then here's where to buy. One of the most difficult things is to, is to find the native plants at nurseries. And so when I click on that where to buy, it brings up a, a great list here. Um, one of these is sponsored by the NC Plant uh, Native Plant Society, and it brings up nurseries all over the state where you can find native plants for sale. Now, we made it through. We're two minutes to spare before eight o'clock. And here are your resources. And I'm gonna leave this up for y'all. And um, we're going to start looking at these. Uh, we're going to start looking at these questions here. A lot of y'all sent direct messages. Let's see. And y'all feel free to to unmute too. Um, 
And I, I hate to cram all that information in, and I hope we got through most of what y'all wanted to know about. Um, but it's a lot of stuff to get through. So I appreciate you sticking with us. So the first question That's I see is, is it safe to remove tree roots growing on top of the lawn? And so that's species dependent, of course. Um, but one of the things that I, I would oh, caution you about whenever you're removing a tree root, some of those tree roots are tied to certain branches in the canopy. And so when you cut the tree root down here, you might see flagging up there. Now that's not every species of tree. Some of them you'll get away with it, but as a general rule, it's not a good idea. The other thing you don't wanna do with your tree roots is come back and cover them up with new soil. What that'll do is it'll smother your plants. Um, I can't tell you how many times these folks, they, they see these things on Pinterest and they'll come in and they'll, they'll put soil and they'll put mulch and then they'll have a retaining wall around the outside of the tree and they'll plant flowers inside of it. Somewhere between two and five years later, I'm going to get a call because that tree has died. And the reason it died is because it, it, it just slowly suffocated. And so you don't want to put anything on top of them. You really don't want to cut them out if you can help it. What All can right. you do? What's that? I asked the question. So, what, what, so there's really nothing you can do. One of the best things you can do is increase your mulch bed. Um, it, it's, it's really good for the tree. Uh, when you when you put a mulch bed down, and, and now we're not talking about volcano mulch where it comes up, um, but really coming a fist width out from the trunk of the tree and then laying down two to three inches of hardwood or, or pine bark mulch out to the point where those roots are no longer an issue is one of the best things you can do. Um, that helps to keep the roots warm in the wintertime, helps to keep them cool in the summertime, and helps to conserve moisture. Um, and lastly, it protects the base of the, of the, the, the trunk from any kind of uh, mechanical damage, maybe hitting it with the mower, going around it with a string trimmer, something like that. Remember, anytime we cut the bark of the tree, all that conductive tissue is right underneath of it. So the recommendation there would be for a mulch ring. What if, what if there are long roots that are like growing towards the house? I'm not talking and, about roots that are like I mean, they're like in the backyards, you know, if you have a lot of trees in your yard, I mean, you could get, I don't know if anybody else has a problem, but I mean, tree roots down here, they grow through the lawns. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so I mean, I'm kind of new to the area, but it's like, it's, um, it's amazing. Well, so it's one like, thing I would, I would say is that you, it's really hard to get turf, good lawn in, in larger trees to coexist. And so I think you'll get a lot out of that mulch ring. Now, if they're growing way out into the yard, I know some of these canopies on these trees are huge. Um, and a lot of times the root system is gonna go two and a half times as far as the branches do. And so when they get up into your yard, um, really, you know, it's kind of hit or miss. You can prune them, um, you can prune them back. Uh, the thing you really don't wanna do is constantly shear them with the top of your mower. Hmm. Right. Next question, raised bed question over heavy clays. Uh, plants that like sandy soil, good drainage, should you add sand to the raised bed soil composition? Would drainage rock at the base of the clay help? Can you create berms? All right, so for plants that like sandy soil um, and good drainage, you, know, you really wanna get them up a little bit higher. That's the main thing that you're after. Uh, if you're gonna incorporate a little bit of sand in there, that's fine. Um, really whatever your planting mix needs to be uh, so that those plants, those particular plants will work, whatever you're using. Um, two, would the drainage rock, uh, would drainage rock at the base help over the clay? Um, anytime you do that, you create a perched water level, just like I was talking about with the bowl um, or just putting uh, different soil on top different. of the ground. And so you're gonna have a, a, a layer that stays wet that doesn't actually drain. So just keep that in mind. It doesn't matter whether it's, it's just like a planter, like a house plant. In a house plant or a liner at the nursery, either one, you're gonna have a layer, depending on how big the, the, the liner is, in a gallon pot, you're gonna have a layer about that big that doesn't necessarily drain. And so keep that in mind when you're, you're judging how big to make your bed. There's going to be an area down there, whether whether it's rock, whether it's sand, um, 
where that clay meets the soil that you're putting in, that's going to stay wet. So keep that in mind. Um, so no, it doesn't necessarily help. Um, it doesn't make it any better. Uh, it doesn't really change that area at all, to be honest. Um, can you create berms? I'm not sure what you mean by berms. Uh-oh. My husband keeps murdering my crepe myrtles despite my best efforts to stop him. It is extremely frustrating, especially since I'm a master gardener. Can he be cured? No, I'm not touching that one. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it's a perception thing. And it, we have landscapers that do it that know better. Um, but it's a perception thing. And oftentimes the reason that we're doing it is because we think that it's going to give us more flowers. Uh, but actually what it does, instead of giving us more flowers, it gives us single larger flowers. And so we don't have flowers that last as long. So if we're not, if we're not chopping them off every year, um, we should have a month and a half to two months of bloom period on a crepe myrtle. Uh, however, if you're cutting them off, your blooms are going to come later and they're going to be real big and single and heavy. And what that does is when we get the winds that we typically do in the summertime, it makes them really prone to breakage. And so you could lose all of those blooms in a good wind event. The other thing is you only have one flower. Whereas when you leave them alone, you have multiple flowers on that one stem. Awesome. And so when that one flower mm -hmm. dies out, it really that. shortens yeah, your bloom you period. Those cross branches. Mm -hmm. I've got to do that with my uh, olive. So help, I have centipede grass. Since I fertilize in June, what do I use for pre-emergent? I don't want to fertilize with it. Do you have a specific product to buy? Centipede grass, I go back to simazine and atrazine. These are two chemicals that you can currently get under their, their current label. Um, however, you're not going to be able to get them for long because the EPA has just changed that label. Um, so my advice would be to get it and get it quick. Atrazine has both pre-emergent and post-emergent activity, and it's one of the only ones that's safe for centipede year round. So that you can actually spray during green up and it won't harm the centipede. Now, your question, I think, if I'm reading it correctly, is referencing weed and feed. Now, weed and feed is a terrible idea on any warm season grass. And the reason is because we have two parts to it. We have weed, which mm -hmm. is going to be either a pre-emergent or a post-emergent application of herbicide. That's not a bad thing. Uh, but we have feed, and the feed part is fertilizer. And so when we're supposed to be putting that weed and feed out, it's typically early March is what they tell you on the label. And so we're not ready to fertilize our grasses at that point. If we fertilize centipede grass in March and we have a, a, a mid-April freeze or or frost, um, we could set ourselves up to kill our entire lawn. So that's not something we really want to do. Now that's an extreme case. It may or may not happen. Um, chances are not, but it, it very well could. So be very uh, careful what you're putting out as far as fertilizer. They do mention fertilizing in June. Uh, half a pound on centipede in June is the perfect time and the perfect amount. When I say half a pound, I'm talking about nitrogen only. Now, again, always get that soil test to see what other things that you need um, in regard to phosphorus and potash. Let's see, here's another centipede. Nope. That is all the questions. Does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask out loud? What, what is, when you go to Lowe's and get the, like the, um, the uh, weed. Um, you gotta get that, that right away. I don't know if it's a yeah, weed. It's or tomorrow. Tomorrow. Can you hear me? I missed a little bit of that. And you go to Lowe's and you get what? I, yeah, I, I can't remember the name of the, the brand name. It may be a spectrocyte. Is that a pre or post emergent? Like when you get the, the um, you know, it's for, it doesn't kill the grass, but it kills the weeds or controls the weeds. More often than not, it's going to be a post emergent, but it really depends on what the active ingredient is. So spectrocyte as a, a, a brand name is going to make probably, you know, 10 to a, a, a dozen products that they're going to sell in different markets. And so what you really need to look at is the active ingredient. 
Um, in order to do that, typically in the lower left-hand corner, it, it's going to give you those active ingredients and the percentage that's in them. Um, most of the time when you're, you're looking at, at treating your lawn with a post-emergent, any kind of three-way or four-way product is going to work. And that's going to be a combination of three or four different chemicals. It's typically going to consist of 2,4-D, dicamba, mecaprop, um, several combinations of several others. Um, and they're, they're fairly benign and they're safe to use on most of the grasses. Uh, but be very careful to read a label uh, because your, your, your label uh, are, are those, uh, especially 2,4-D, um, centipede is sensitive to 2,4-D. So there's going to be a lesser amount, a lesser rate it's going to be recommended for centipede grass. So make sure you pay attention to that kind of thing. Um, I really can't stress enough sticking with atrazine or, or uh, simazine, uh, those two chemicals, and they will be, um, there'll be one called Princep, uh, would be simazine, and there's several other different labels. And then atrazine, you'll find by the label atrazine, it'll be called atrazine. Uh, there's a high yield label that's sold at Walmart, um, or you can buy online. Um, so look for that kind of stuff to be able to put on your centipede. Thank you. Are we on speaker? Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. How do we, uh, what do you, what is the best thing to do when we have a question? Do we call um, your office? Do you should see all my contact attention? information on there. Um, and there are several master gardeners that, that live in the Cypress Landing area that can help you out. Um, you can find them there, or you can call over here on Mondays and Wednesdays starting around mid-March, and we'll have what we call the Green Line. And that's a helpline that Master Gardeners man so that they can take your calls, help you out with questions just like we're doing here. Um, you know, that kind of stuff, it, it's, it's very important to get the right information. And so what Master Gardeners are, they're volunteers that are taught by me to be an extension of what I do, just like I'm an extension of what the, the, uh, the uh, college does. And so, um, you know, they go through a very rigorous program to learn uh, what to do and, and how to answer questions and where to find information and that kind of thing. So they're a great resource. Um, again, Mondays and Wednesdays, you can talk to them. Any other day, you'll get me. You, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Absolutely. You house calls. It sounds it sound like from one comment you made earlier, you actually you actually go to people's homes and check out like problem areas or something. Yeah, if I can't figure out what it is uh, by looking at pictures and, and you know talking to you about it, I will do home visits. Um, that's really been cut back during our uh, our our pandemic deal here. Um, so I I do those, um, but I try to keep those to a minimum anymore. Gene, before everybody leaves, don't forget to mention about the gardening guide. Oh, yeah. And also uh, the vegetable plant sale coming up. Ooh. Yeah. So the second week of April, we'll have a, a plant sale that'll go all week long. Um, and you'll be able to order online. And you'll schedule a time to come and pick your plants up. Uh, so that we can minimize contact and all that kind of stuff. But all those plants are, are um, uh, propagated here by seed, uh, by master gardeners. We grow them up in our, our greenhouse for you. Uh, they, they're pretty healthy and, and ready to go. They look real good. And then the uh, gardening guide, I thought I had a copy right here, but I must have given it away. Um, all I have is this. There we go. A gardening guide is a, a very comprehensive, um, a little over 100 pages worth of information that's been put yeah. together um, through Master Gardeners doing that green line over the years. And so it, it pretty much uh, is all encompassing with, uh, with horticulture and, and the problems that we see in Beaufort County. The other thing, I, I, there's, I've got two other things I wanted to share. Um, this is a, a book of native plants. That is really good. Um, it, it's been it's been put out by Paul Hosier, and I got to meet Paul. Um, but it, it's uh, it's put out by UNC Press, and you can find these links. Uh, I believe, <clears throat> if I'm not mistaken, there's one on the the plant toolbox, and then if you go under resources on the uh, Sea Grant page that I showed you a minute ago, 
you can order it right from there. And then the other thing I wanted to share, and you know, because it's so easy to use, um, I pull a lot of information from our Extension Gardener Handbook. Now, this is our new uh, Master Gardener teaching tool. This That's is what cool. we use to teach all the Master Gardeners. Um, very comprehensive text that, that uh, really will take you all the way through um, from house plants to vegetables to fruit trees to shade trees, bushes, and everything in between. Um, awesome resource. Has a great section on soils, uh, organic amendments, uh, compost. Um, and you can buy this in hard copy or you can get it for free online. Uh, and mm. just, um, I'm pretty sure I put a link on there for that. No, I didn't. Well, no. if you go to the, the gardener uh, Extension Gardener Plant Toolbox um, and you look at those links on the side where I showed you the C Grant link is, there's one for this as well. And it retails for about 60 or 70 bucks if you buy it from UNC Press. Um, but again, uh, you can get it online. It's just not as nice and neat. Now, there was one other question. Um, do those products cause much trouble for honeybees as Roundup does? So... When you look at your label, um, there's a, a, a specific thing on that Push, label it. that will say be safe, B-E-E -E, safe. Um, and that's how you'll know whether it's something that's harmful to bees or not. And one of the main recommendations that we'll give, uh, you know, bees don't fly when it's under 55 degrees, bees don't fly at night. And so if you're in an area where maybe you have some, some beehives or, uh, you know, maybe a neighbor does or something like that, and you know you're using a chemical that may be harmful to them, you know, obviously you want to talk to them. Uh, but the other thing you want to do is you want to read that label. And so if it's something that, that is a problem or can be a problem, uh, you want to follow exactly what that label does, uh, tells you to do in regard to application. And one of the ways that you can mitigate those issues is by spraying when it's under 55 or whether it, it's at nighttime, because we know we don't have bee flight during any of those times. Wonderful. Jean, also, if people are interested in the gardening guide, uh, they all have my email address and they can certainly ask, you know, that via email. And there you go. Um, and then I'll let you know how many you need. The cost uh, is $5. <laughs> it's a yep. wonderful document. I happen to be involved in uh, the first couple. And anything you need to know. A through Z, beginner to advanced. Isn't that what we say? Thank you, Julie. We're in our, our 3.0 revision of this. So it's been revised at least three times. Right. Um, it's just, it's got a whole lot of information in it. And I'm curious also, Jean, you and I had talked about maybe doing this for a summer session and perhaps a fall session, whether or not people are interested in that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Would you be? Then I if, would. If you are, then we need to uh, hear from you. I, I'll certainly be the contact point if you want to send me an email or call me what some of the questions are that Jean can prepare for the subsequent. Uh, yes, Sandra. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's me. <laughs> Hi, Sandra. <laughs> you get all the answers, Kevin. I need some help. <laughs> You're in big trouble. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, this was very good, Jean. I think everybody was pleased with uh, everything in the short period of time that you had to do it. Thank you, Jean. Absolutely. Thank you all for, for hanging in there. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Y'all have a good evening. Yeah, be in, be in touch with me. Anytime. Okay. We'll do Thank that you anytime. Um, yeah, if y'all put another survey out through the Environmental Committee, uh -huh. uh, just just let me know and we'll we'll schedule it and get it done. Okay, let's do it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, right, Anne. Bye, Jean. Thank you, Thanks, Judy. And thank you, Judy. Bye. 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 -bye. Gene, I'll, I'll call you. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Have a good evening. You too.